Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, broadcast. Uh, we will get started in about 30 seconds, just after we've had a chance to let people join us. Hi, everybody. Hello, my name is Miguel de Souza, and welcome to today's uh, broadcast. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to start today just by acknowledging the traditional custodians of these lands on which we meet and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and community. I pay my respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present, and emerging. My name is Miguel de Souza. I'm Google's News Teaching Fellow for 2021. I'm a journalist and teacher trainer. I've worked on the internet putting out news since 1994 for companies like AAP, news.com.au7 and SBS. Thanks for joining us today. Feel free to ask questions during the live broadcast by typing them into the chat box. We'll go through the chat at the end of uh, the broadcast and answer any of your questions. Uh, in the meantime, I might just throw my uh, details into banner for you, but uh, I'll just, so let's get, get started. Thanks for joining us. Today we're going to look at COVID-19 reporting tools. We we'll should clock in at around half an hour, give or take. Now what are we going to look at exactly? Well for starters, I'm going to take a look at what tools can get you started. First stop on your workflow of understanding the complex science behind the vaccine, the numbers around the spread of the disease, and the rollout of the vaccine itself. Then we'll hear about a fantastic new resource just put out by the Australian Science Media Centre, which will help with the accuracy of your reporting and fact checking, as well as from a real fact checker from Australian Associated Press. Now, a little bit about my job. The News Teaching Fellowship, which is part of the Google News Initiative, or GNI. Google's investing in technological innovation to empower newsrooms. It's worth having a really quick look at what some of the, the innovative tools Google has developed. Google's gathered together its tools for journalists in the journalist studio. Uh, Outline makes it easy to create your own personal VPN, while Project Shield can defend small news, human rights or elections monitoring organisations, or even individual journalists from DDoS attacks. You'll also find the database analysis tool pinpoint there. More on those in the next uh, in, in coming weeks. I'll share the URL in the, uh, ba in the banner with you below. Now, let's just, uh, now, as the world grappled with a constantly changing story around coronavirus, fact-checking became not just important for journalists, but it became a matter of public health. The spread of misinformation, disinformation and malinformation was critical in tackling and slowing the spread of the virus itself. Now, let's kick off with a few definitions. Misinformation was one of the big issues at the beginning of the coronavirus. People simply did not know what was true, and often rumours were spread with the best of intention, such as cures or ways to avoid the disease. These have caught, subsequently caused great harm. Occasionally errors in news stories, official speeches, and instances like that drove the confusion too. Now, disinformation uh, is something that's starting to rise now as we move into the global vaccination program with the existing anti-vaxxer movement, uh, coupled with celebrities knowingly spread, spreading false information about vaccines which could discourage the uptake of the vaccine, um, especially amongst really vulnerable groups. And we've got to counteract those spreading malinformation for commercial gain or perhaps even worse. So today we're going to take a look at reporting tools and resources for coronavirus, covering the COVID-19 virus and vaccine. We'll be joined by an expert fact checker, Peter Bodkin from AAP Fact Check, and a scientific expert and communicator, Dr. Suzanne Elliott from the Australian Science Media Centre, but first, let's have a look at just um, a little bit of the challenge of covering this global pandemic. Now, the crucial issue of cover reporting the COVID virus is challenging the propensity for the most alarming angles of the story to be the most shared on social platforms. Here's a chart from the social media monitoring tool Spike Newsweb. 
Now, this records interactions on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and in this case, looked at the top shared news articles during January 2021 about the vaccine. Now, as you can see, the top article here by quite a way is about the death of a vaccine recipient. But then headlines like this, uh, this translates as AstraZeneca, fear in Europe, don't necessarily help, especially when the reality of the situation is quite different. Now, more on this uh, a little bit later on. Locally, there are a few fronts to cover. Some communities, especially those reliant on social media, are vulnerable to false claims being pushed by anti-vaccination groups on social media. Worryingly, there are signs that groups opposed to vaccination programs in the United States have taken their message, movement, and the donations, likes, and followers that flow right around the world. What you're looking at here is an Instagram post by an organization called Freedom, The Freedom Keepers. They're an anti-vaccination organization started in response to the passing of the Senate Bill SB 376 in the US state of California. The post targets indigenous communities, not with a direct anti-vaccination message, but wholesome, earthy images of young mums, families, and gentle messages about questioning norms. Remote indigenous communities use social media heavily, but are poorly represented in Australian news media coverage, which leads me to consider a bit of a tangent. Where are we looking? That's the interesting thing. Um, the, the point I wanted to make here is, is that uh, we have uh, undertaken a call. Let me just switch to this. Apologize, I just have to do just make a little bit of a modification here while I uh, check something. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, practitioners, medical practitioners around the world and the sorts of s steps of success that they've had. Now, uh, let me just quickly see if I can get my presentation back into order. Apologize for the little technical hitch there. Oops. Okay, I'm going to just grab, do a little bit of live editing here while we uh, As I say, folks, sometimes you really do have to be careful when you're working with live technology. Give me one more second and I will be back with you. Uh, we, I was going to tell you about Dr. Fahana Hussein, who is a practicing GP in the UK, and we will be back with her in one second. Uh, in the interim, I will remind you that if you do have any questions, don't hesitate to use the chat window. Uh, let's just... This, there we go. All right, let's give that a try. I'm almost there, folks. And we are back, folks. Thank you for your patience. So this is Dr. Fazana Hussein. She's a GP of the year, one of the faces of uh, the NHS's birthday campaign, and a London GP in an area with a large South Asian 
African and East European population. Now, she's recently undertaken to call each and every one of her patients who expressed uh, concern or hesitation at taking the vaccine. It's a really cute story and it kind of speaks to the reality of the situation on the ground. She's proved very successful uh, and her story has resonated with England's South Asian population. Now, in Australia, our PM, Health Minister and uh, many other senior men members of government have got behind the vaccine and rollout. And even outliers have come back to the fold after some convincing. In fact, we might face similarly high levels of hesitancy here too, as this lack of diversity contributes to low levels of trust in media and government, compounded by those institutions' historical and low levels of cultural and gender or racial diversity. Now, um, my point here is, is that uh, there are, uh, for instance, works of people, and unfortunately I can't show you an image, but uh, Professor Kanta Subarao, who leads the antiviral research at the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection. Um, she also works uh, at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, looking at the damage that COVID-19 can do to organs. Um, there's also the story of Arnab Ghoshroy, who is a young Bengali uh, law student at Victoria University, who has managed to successfully and single-handedly convince the Australian government to translate COVID-19 information into Bangla for Australia's 51,000 Bengali speakers. Um, it is, it's fair to say that these stories are being covered in some aspects of the Australian media, but sadly, um, uh, not all of them. And I guess this leads me to uh, my next point, which is that quote that you're reading up there is unfortunately not actually about Pete Evans, who seems to just attract coverage for his expression of bizarre views, which actually has the effect of boosting his followings online. Banning him off mainstream platforms like TV, then Insta and Facebook added to his appeal. Now that quote is actually from the editor of The Plain Dealer in Cleveland, Ohio, in the United States, who said its journalists intend to ignore inaccurate statements from a Republican Senate candidate that they considered to be ploys for attention. Now it's a novel approach. Put the decision over whether to bother covering statements that aren't factual back into the journalist's hands. Crazy. Um, anyway, one postscript when this candidate challenged the plain dealers reported to a debate about the COVID restrictions, the new newspaper also declined. Um, even though the paper's reporter, uh, Leela Atassi, was happy to use facts and science to obliterate his claims, they declined because they knew he wanted to use their platform to get attention with demonstrably false claims about the virus. Now, back to using platforms. Uh, one of our guests, Peter Bodkin, shared this crowd tangle graph of the rise in the uh, following of Craig Kelly's follower base. Uh, every time he posts about, or well, rather after he started posting about quack cures. Now we might return to a discussion about that later on, but you can see here that for, for politicians, uh, you know, people on a grift in a sense, there's a clear uh, advantage in, in sharing false information um, because it certainly does uh, return. Okay, so um, the first thing to check when you are debunking a fake news story is has this already been debunked? One of the quickest ways of doing this is to check Google's Fact Check Explorer. Um, this is Google's attempt to index all of the world's fact checks in the one place. Um, and uh, it is worth keeping that as your, your first uh, point of stop. So. Again, uh, you know, here's a quick sample of some of the recent fact checks produced by AFP, AAP, and many other media agencies about COVID. No, there is no RFID chip in the vaccine. Uh, no, the vaccine does not cause infertility and doesn't seem to sort of infertility in Bill Gates either. And no, the New York Times did not endorse the Chinese vaccines. And no, Australia did not shut down its entire COVID vaccine program because it killed people. Conspiracy theorists, false news peddlers, hot babes and anti-vax uh, and, and, and guys for the anti-vax or pro-plague movement um, are usually on a grift of some kind. And um, it seems that they work on trading lies, fear and suspicion for likes, followers, reputation or just plain dollars. Um, now, while we're on the subject, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our first guest. Uh, Peter Bodkin, thank you very, very much for joining us. Uh, I do apologize about the technical problems, but I've got a question for you. When it comes to verification, what's your workflow? Where do you start? 
Well, there's, there's several steps in the process for us. So the, the starting point for any uh, fact check or looking at misinformation will be um, the natural starting point, which is identifying the potential misinformation that is out there. Um, so there's different approaches that we would use for that, depending on whether we're monitoring traditional media or social media. Uh, with traditional media, so statements by politicians, other public figures, um, we would use a couple of tools, things like um, Google Alerts is very powerful. You might set up a search term for a particular polit uh, politician and the term vaccine, for example, if you know that it's something that they're vocal on. Um, and then you'll see every time they mention that in an interview. Uh, we also use something called LexisNexis, which is a little bit more powerful because it even gives you things like transcripts of broadcast interviews that people have done, and you can monitor those for keywords, but that is a paid tool. Um, and then for social media, we look at different tools depending on the platform, but things that will enable us to monitor um, the most popular networks for um, claims that are starting to get some traction. So um, we're a Facebook third-party fact-checking partner, which gives us access to a, a tool that they have built specifically for this purpose. Um, but one tool that people in the media commonly use for this kind of work is CrowdTangle. Um, that's for monitoring Facebook, Instagram, and Reddit. And essentially on that, we would build lists of pages and groups that commonly share misinformation. And then we, we monitor that for new claims that are going viral. Um, and that is something that we would then earmark as a potential fact check. Um, there are other tools, other platforms, so things like TweetDeck for monitoring Twitter. Um, you can set up lists of accounts that commonly share misinformation. Um, you can monitor for particular keywords. There are lots of other platforms out there, uh, some of which have, have tools, some of which you really need to search the platforms themselves. But essentially the approach is the same. We would build lists of accounts and uh, groups that share misinformation, even if, if that's just in a spreadsheet. Um, and then we would go through those and look at things that are kind of jumping out as potential misinformation and things that we could fact check. Then once we've identified something, we would ask ourselves, well, is this a good candidate for fact checking? And there's a, a range of filters that would be involved in that thought process, things like what's the reach and the potential impact of this of this piece of misinformation. Um, so for that, obviously we would look at the data on the post themselves. If someone is shared to Facebook, how many shares does that post have? How many comments does it have? If it's on Twitter, how many retweets that it has? Essentially, what's the reach of this uh, bit of potential misinformation? Um, for this, we also use CrowdTangle. It has got a very handy Chrome extension, which we can use to look at the shares on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Reddit for a, a particular article. So if there's something that's going viral, maybe from a blog site, um, we can monitor it on that. Then we would look at whether this is already being fact-checked. So is there anything new or different about the claim that we are seeing? Um, the Google Fact Check Explorer that you already mentioned mm. is a really great tool for that. So we would search in that for some of the key terms that we're um, we're seeing you know, in a post or in a claim. Um, the Coronavirus Facts Alliance, which is an initiative of the Poynter Institute um, that manages the International Fact Checking Network. Um, they have a really great database that fact checking organisations like us who are signatories feed into. And then you can search for that for, for the terms that might be related to what you're looking at. And then we would look at how serious the misinformation is. So what are the implications if we didn't fact check something? So yeah. for example, one piece of uh, vaccine related misinformation that we've seen is about vaccines containing microchips to monitor people. We would weigh up something like that against say a claim that vaccines have caused thousands of deaths. And probably we would fact check the, the claim about deaths first because that's something that is more likely to have real world consequences that may cause people to not want to take the vaccine in large numbers, more so than people who believe a more far-fetched conspiracy theory around microchipping and, and monitoring and so on. And then we would look at 
is the claim actually false or misleading? What's the evidence to support or against the claim? Um, and at that point, we would look to official sources of information, um, the data experts, independent research that's out there, and try and work out for ourselves well, is this something that is even uh, is even necessary to fact check? Being cautious of the difference between opinion and fact, so people can express opinions, whether it's politicians, whether it's on social media, about things like um, being cautious of taking a vaccine. Of course, there's no problem there, and that's not something that we can fact check. But if someone is making a clear false statement that then supports their view that they, people should be wary of taking a vaccine, that's something that we would look at fact checking. And then for the, the kind of last stage in the process, once you've identified something that is worth fact checking, we would look at how we debunk it. So a lot of that's traditional journalistic research work, uh, talking to experts, digesting information, making sure that we communicate it clearly and accurately. Um, but there are a lot of good resources specific to this type of work that you that you can draw on. So uh, one of them would be uh, Cymex, which is an initiative from the, the Science Media Centre, who I think you'll hear from later. Um, that's great for finding experts, particularly in Australia and New Zealand, who can talk about a particular topic. Um, Google Scholar is also a really handy tool for searching scientific research. So if you want to see, you know, is there a study that investigated um, the efficacy of masks, for example, you can look for it there. And then uh, you can use that as part of your fact check potentially, or just use it to inform your own knowledge around a topic. Um, and then there are a few technical tools as well that we would generally use as part of our fact checking process. Things like um, Archive Today, which is used for uh, archiving pages and social media posts. Um, the Wayback Machine is a great tool. Um, that way, we, with that, we can look at uh, whether whether pages have been changed, look for old versions, look for deleted versions of pages, and um, there's a really great way of seeing how information may have changed over time. Um, and then we have some basic kind of verification tools that we would use with certain types of fact checks, reverse image searches like Google Images. Um, there's a great extension called RevEye for Chrome, which enables you to do reverse image searches across multiple platforms. And we would use that in examples where someone has used an image. They might have said, for example, that um, this image of Scott Morrison getting vaccinated was actually taken in 2015. By doing a reverse image search, we can often prove this was taken when it was said it was, or this was taken at a different time to how people are using it on social media. And then similarly, we use a tool called InVid, which has a Chrome extension for doing video verification work um, that enables us to do some reverse uh, searching on videos to, again, work out things like when it was taken, the context, um, all those kind of bits of background information that can be useful. But all of that's really feeding into some general principles that we try and apply to all of our fact checking, which is finding out who the source of a particular piece of information is um, that will give us some background about whether or not they have a history of spreading misinformation, do they have a potential agenda, what's their credibility. Um, we need to ask a lot of questions throughout that whole process, so a lot of that is just the kind of fundamental journalistic work that people would do in all of their journalism, which is contacting people, asking questions, contacting the author of the scientific study to find out a little bit more about their methodology, or contacting a journalist who's written about a particular topic to see if they can give some more context that might help you with a fact check. Questioning your own assumptions. So sometimes something that you assume is false might prove to be true and vice versa. And that's a really important part of, of all of our processes. Um, and in doing all that, we also need to be very careful about how we present misinformation, that we are careful of repeating falsehoods so that we don't give misinformation extra undue prominence without clearly stating how or where it's false. Um, it, research has shown that people are much more likely to believe misinformation when it's repeated, and that's something that we need to, to be careful of in all of our processes as well. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point, actually, because, I mean, it, it, it almost speaks to uh, what the uh, what the, uh, the Plain Dealers editor was sort of saying, is this, like, 
um, it's that fine balance of debunking something while not drawing attention to it so much. Um, Peter, it's um, really interesting to hear from you. Have you has there been a um, uh, can you characterize the sort of volume that you've seen? Has it been, a, a, you know, have you seen a surge since the news of the, the, the vaccine being rolled out has started to, to break? Or a, a, do you notice any sort of pattern or ebb and flow to this? Well, it's been consistent through the, the stream of misinformation throughout the pandemic has been consistent. Um, that said, there's obviously been an explosion in misinformation um, and claims around vaccines since vaccination rollout programs started. And that's mm. probably become the core um, focus of misinformation around COVID-19 now that we're in this slightly later stage of the pandemic. Um, some of the claims change or evolve over time. So, you know, you'll see something that started off as being a questioning of the rigour of vaccine trials and then uh, over time that will become a claim about um, side effects and it will kind of be a constant evolution of that piece, piece of misinformation. And then other examples, you'll have something completely new that seemingly comes out of nowhere um, that's, you know, a new piece of misinformation. So it is constantly evolving. It's hard to say that, you know, the volume now is any worse than it was a few months ago, but... Yeah. Um, there is a, definitely a constant stream and um, there's a lot of innovation in the, the misinformation space, so it's something that you need to always be on top of. Yeah. Well, look, Peter, thank you so much for uh, joining us. I'm, I'm going to uh, press on a little bit and uh, uh, you might stick around and maybe if we have a few questions, we might uh, answer them. But, look, thank you again so much. Um, Look, we are going to uh, just uh, press on a bit, as I said. Um, look, the virus has been a showcase for some of the great data work that is being done in Australian newsrooms, uh, especially uh, here's an example, for instance, at the ABC Story Lab, which uh, has kept track of the vaccine rollout with this page. But um, I want to now switch to uh, resources and... Uh, it's really important for me to mention a few of these databases. Firstly, you have uh, the Pointer International Fact Checking Network, of which AAP Fact Check is a member. Uh, and you do have the Google Fact Check Explorer and also uh, the Full Fact Coronavirus Index, um, which we were talking about. But um, in Australia, we also have, uh, or rather, there's also this resource, which is really quite a, an amazing page. Uh, it's called learnaboutcovid19.org. Uh, it works very much uh, through uh, a, a very dynamic sort of search-based uh, thing. Just start keying in your um, uh, query, and uh, it's a collaboration between fact-checkers, journalists, and medical experts, and perhaps this is where uh, I guess this, this strand of sort of journalism is going. The project's aim is to get answers for journalists in as timely a manner as possible. Uh, and, look, the team of experts includes researchers from Harvard, um, the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Stanford Health Communications. But look, um, what I'd like to do now is to introduce you to uh, a guest we have, Susanna, uh, Dr. Susanna Elliott. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you um, um, waiting uh, to join the chat, Susanna. Um, Thanks, we, uh, You're here to talk about a fantastic resource that you have uh, and uh, a very significant team of people around the world have been working on. Uh, I'd love to hear uh, all about it. Great. Okay. So thanks, Miguel. I'll share my screen and uh, let's just hope that I can get my technology to work. <laughs> oh, look, you, I, I set the bar today, so I'm I'm uh, hoping <laughs> that uh, you guys you guys go go much better than me. <laughs> but uh, in any case, we. Um, I'm just going to, while you're doing that, I'm just going to make sure I'm showing the uh, the, uh, the URL for the COVID vaccine hub. Okay, so there you go. I'll add that. There you right. are. Right. And you can see that, hopefully. Yes, it's coming up. Yes, beautiful. terrific. Okay. All right. So, look, what I thought I'd do is I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes giving you the background to this big international effort that we just launched on Wednesday this week. Um, because really this is, um, this is actually a collaboration of seven different organisations. And I thought that if I can explain to you a little bit the way that we work here in, in Australia, 
then that will tell you a bit about how the other organisations are working and how we are actually able to pull everything together. So um, the Australian Science Media Centre is obviously a resource for journalists. And uh, one of the major things that we have created is this thing that, um, that was mentioned earlier called CIMEX or the Science Media Exchange is the long form. And basically it's a hub of research and expert reaction and expertise and information about a whole range of things, not just COVID, but obviously a lot of uh, different science topics. And it's kind of where science meets the news, if you like. Um, so what I thought I'd do is I'll just focus on the COVID um, related resources that we have here. So one of the things that we've done is we've created a resource for journalists on COVID-19. And this is a place where you can find a lot of different things. You can, you can find, for example, that we have a, a group of about 90 experts from Australia and then another pool from New Zealand via the New Zealand Science Media Centre. Um, and when you click on that button, you'll find um, a whole bunch of experts with their expertise. And then if you choose one of those, you'll be able to get things like their mobile phone numbers. You'll get some more information that's kind of off the screen, but there's um, information about them, about what kind of media they're used to doing. So if they're comfortable with live television, they'll tell you. Um, and also, yeah, as I said, after hours contact numbers, how they've reacted to different topics in the past. So this particular expert has given us reaction to different things. So you can actually click on their um, story there on the right-hand side and find out how they've been reacting. And that will give you a bit of an idea of whether they're the right sort of person for your story. It also has their Twitter feed and sometimes you'll even find video there so you can see what they're like in front of the camera. So it's very much a sort of, you know, expertise talent pool, if you like, for journalists. Uh, the other thing that we have there are lists of um, re research, relevant research. And when you click on any of these papers, you will um, be given the page that has all of the information you need to write up that story. So it'll include um, contact details for the authors and media contacts. It'll also give you some information, which is something we do for all of the stories that we put on Cymex now, about this particular study, so for example, is it peer reviewed? And I'm sure you will know that there's been some real issues around papers that are called preprints that have not been peer reviewed and then they get retracted. Um, and that has actually led to a lot of issues, I think, in the media because when a paper's put out, journalists don't always understand that if it hasn't been peer reviewed, then it may not be that reliable. And if it gets lots of coverage and then it gets changed or retracted, then that can create obviously a lot of confusion. Um, we also say whether what sort of study it is, whether it's experimental or observational or, you know, various other kinds of, of studies and whether it was done, for example, on mice or on cells in a dish or on humans, um, which is also incredibly important to understand when you're reporting on science. Um, you'll also find links to the full research articles, any media releases that are available and sometimes if it's controversial, there'll even be something called an expert reaction. So for example, when the WHO released their report on the origins of COVID-19, we had about a dozen experts responding to that. Um, so I've just given you one example here. And again, they'll often provide their mobile number so you can contact them very quickly. And they'll usually um, give you this sort of uh, expert reaction under embargo or sometimes to a breaking news story and you can get hold of them very quickly. So that's kind of the stuff that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we've also, as well as our COVID-19 resource page, we've put out something called the COVID update, which is a daily email that goes into journalists' inboxes and um, it gives you things like the latest research under embargo on COVID-19. And then there are also things, you know, like immediate releases and also different expert reactions and briefings that we may have done that are relevant. So that sort of gives you a bit of background. So if you can imagine the Australian Science Media Centre um, repeated in other countries, other countries like Germany and the UK and Canada and America and uh, New Zealand and now Africa and Taiwan have science media centres. And we all work in slightly different ways, but we're all quite similar and we all do things like expert reactions 
and latest breaking stories and uh, briefings and things like that. So the idea for the COVID-18 vaccine media hub actually came from Google um, because Google had been, in fact, the Google News Initiative, Alexios Metsalis there um, had been noticing the kind of information that science media centres were putting out around the world and called us up one day and said, why don't you guys um, pull all of this great information into one central place so that journalists across the world can get access to all of this good stuff in one place? And we all thought that was a fantastic idea. Um, we teamed up with a techno technology not-for-profit called Medan, which runs the health desk that Miguel showed just a little while ago. Um, and so we, over the last couple of months, have created the COVID Vaccine Media Hub. So I'm just going to take you through that resource and what you can do with it. So at the moment, it is, as I said, a, um, a central place where you can bring together, where you'll find all of the material that all of the different science media centres and the Medan Health Desk have been creating. So when you go there, you'll find this list of uh, the latest material. Um, which is all the explainers, and expert reactions, all of that good, sort of good material. And you'll find, of course, there's lots of things on things like the, the pause of the AstraZeneca vaccine and what experts are saying about this um, link with, with uh, blood clots. Um, you can also see the different organisations and we'll be adding more of those as we go, including the African Science Media Centre, which is very new, and the Taiwanese SMC. And uh, there are other SMCs coming up, so we will probably add those as we go. One of the ways that I've, you know, this has only been launched a few days, so it's still early days and we're very keen to get feedback on it. But one of the things that I noticed early on is um, a very interesting way that some journalists are using it. So, for example, Liam Mannix at The Age uh, had a look at, at what different scientists in different countries were saying about the AstraZeneca vaccine and the reports of blood clotting. And I think that's quite an interesting way to use this because, you know, you can you can look at what experts are saying in one individual country, but you may be concerned, for example, that scientists are not speaking their mind. There may be policies in place that stop them from, from talking openly to the media. I'm not saying that's the case here, but in some countries that definitely is the case. So this gives you a kind of, um, you know, a sort of second... Uh, opinion, if you like, from different countries. And so he was able to go to uh, expert comments from Germany, from Australia, from Britain, from New Zealand. And then there were others that were, came in from America and from various other places. And they were all pretty much saying the same thing. And so that was really a great way of being able to confirm um, what the science and what the scientific community collectively is saying. Um, so, you know, when you go into the search there, you can find um, explainers on all kinds of topics, all to do with COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and you can also contact individual organisations. So if you're an Australian journalist and you want to get hold of somebody in the UK Science Media Centre or in the German Science Media Centre, you can just click through and you'll be able to contact them. Um, in terms of things that are coming soon, we, we decided that we'd put this... Um, hub out there for journalists to use, even though we don't consider it to be perfect. Um, it's It still has some bells and whistles to be added, but we thought it was better to get it out fast uh, so that it can be used, and then we'll add these features as we go. So one of the features that we're adding is a, um, a, a question page so that journalists from anywhere in the world can ask questions, and that will then be um, farmed out to whichever science media centre or Medan is open uh, for business at that particular time zone. So, you know, we'll ask for your deadline. Um, we'll say that we'll get back to you as soon as we can and it will be provided to whatever, whoever's awake at the time to try and help you um, over a 24-hour cycle. The other thing that's happening is translation into multiple languages and we're working with um, translators without borders. And uh, interestingly, we're translating not just into what you would perceive as sort of the major languages, but also into some languages that are, are really needed. So, for example, in Myanmar at the moment, um, we know that there's not a lot of people around the world speaking Burmese, but they really need this information. And so we're going to translate some of this information into Burmese for that population. Um, the other thing that we're going to add is a list of the latest peer-reviewed publications 
that will be pulled from all the different SMCs. So you'll be able to get links to publications all around the world and get that information about whether they're peer reviewed and whether you can trust them basically. Uh, and you'll be able to search for those quite actively. So um, I think I'll leave it there, Miguel, in case there are any questions. I hope I didn't speak too fast. No, no, I think that was absolutely amazing. And look, thank you so much for sharing all of those amazing resources. There's um, so much there. I, I actually, uh, if if I may, I, I was gonna mention the, the Science Media Center and their tag uh, functionality. One thing I wanted to say was I'm really impressed with um, and many journalists out there will be very impressed with you uh, having a deadline field. Um, I, I have to confess, leading up to this, uh, I didn't want to stress your deadlines too much, but I did actually put my own request in because, again, I mean, in the course of researching for this this uh, session, uh, I started to get uh, sort of anti-vax uh, propaganda being thrown at me, and and some of it was kind of so confusing. I was sort of thinking, oh, you know, so I so I it was a great excuse to use it and use the deadline field. So. Uh, thank you so much. I, I think a lot of journalists will be very, very keen to to use that, and I better make sure that I flash that uh, URL up. Um, and uh, and certainly, I, I, I hear what you're saying about you know get it out to market when so that people can use it, uh, and hopefully um, as well just keep building it and keep improving it and keep refining it. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Um, I'm going to press on just for a little bit. Uh, we've got a little, uh, a few things more to show you. Uh, look, just just a little, just to reinforce uh, what Susanna was saying. Um, again, there are so many fantastic resources. Uh, you're looking at the Science Media Center's website here. Uh, they have a brilliant resource, which uh, again allows you, uh, quite literally, if if you're the sort of person that you know, like me, who who I'm not actually attached to any publications anymore, you can quite literally tweet that expert reaction straight from uh, their index page. And I think that's kind of cool because the thing is, is that what I've also noticed is as well, you know, we're professional journalists, we're, I suppose, and we, we're talking to student journalists and, and some, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of people, community journalists, public radio journalists, but there's also the general community and they're, they're informed and they're interested and they're looking for expert information too. Sometimes that's leading them down the wrong path. But um, this is a great way to uh, get people using it. Now, uh, look, in, in contrast to the types of stories that are most shared on social media, um, I thought I might have a look at trends just to see exactly what sort of picture it paints. Well, here's the 30-day view of searches for the vaccine versus searches for the virus overall. I chose topics rather than search terms because it accounts for things like misspellings and so on. And as you can see, interest in the virus still remains very high overall in Australia. And as news of the virus development has broken, sorry, the vaccine's development has broken, so has interest in it. So now what I want to do is I want to see what happens uh, when you look at uh, those, some of those searches in detail and see exactly what people are looking for. Uh, so I'm just going to, hopefully, you are able to see my trend screen. Yes, you are. So look, just quickly, I want to drill down into uh, some of these other areas. Let's have a quick look. Now, the, the related and rising queries, uh, you can see here uh, relating to, there's a few kind of alarmist little things there, but what I'm more interested in are the top queries. So what I wanted to see was what are the related queries to the COVID vaccine uh, basically, uh, which which have been sort of set in, in stone, and what, what are people searching for? Well, they're searching for the vaccine, vaccine Australia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it's only when we get to, in fact, you know, right now they're starting to get more specific. People are interested in Pfizer or the various brands of them. It's only really when you get into some of the minor uh, searches that we start to see questions about side effects, which I think is a pretty natural thing anyway. All vaccines have side effects of some kind. Um, but again, what's interesting is the vast majority of the searching on legitimate, uh, on the legitimate internet, there's one about deaths, uh, are really about asking for information. Um, again, the rising queries usually are what you find or a snapshot of the last 24 hours. So the thing is, is that these are what is, this is what is responding to exactly what's happening, you know, perhaps in breaking news. However, if you flip around to the top queries, that's when you get to the more sensible sort of stuff that the vast majority of people are actually searching for. So look, it's worthwhile looking at trends. I feel it actually reinforces the point that people are actually looking for legitimate information. 
And let's just talk about that. So what are the public looking for? Well, yes, we know that they search for stuff uh, and, and searches indicate a certain thing. But um, what I noticed was this little great piece of, new, uh, of response from a newsroom here in, uh, in Australia. And that is on the, on, the, on the Sydney Morning Herald, that little piece there on the left right hand side uh, using uh, Flourish, which uh, essentially have downloaded a chart, a spreadsheet of clinic locations for where the vaccination is being administered. Uh, and made it a clickable uh, animated uh, flourish map, which allows people to actually answer a key question that they are asking, which is, where can I get the vaccine? And this also covered things like um, Aboriginal community health centres, GPs, general practices, and GP respiratory clinics. So they used uh, the data uh, and mapping and flourish to essentially you know, a, a, a create a one-stop destination that anybody who was looking for information, just a number or a destination to call uh, in, their, in their local community could respond to. And I think that's a pretty good application of, of some of the metadata that's coming around. Look, if you did find today useful, please do investigate more tools at g.co news training. And thank you very much for joining us today. I would love to thank uh, our guests, uh, Peter Bodkin from AAP Fact Check. Please make sure that you do look up their work and the work of all fact checkers um, around Australia. Uh, you'll find uh, uh, AAP Fact Check's work on Twitter, at AAP Fact Check. And you know what? Let me just make sure I should just give you a little reminder of their uh, Twitter handle. That's AAP Fact Checks. And also, I'd very much like to thank Dr. Susanna Elliott from the Australian Science Media Centre. And you will find them on Twitter at OzMC. And certainly make sure that you do visit their COVID vaccine hub. And for now, uh, my name is Miguel D'Souza. Many thanks. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time.